We all stand? Yep. Yeah. We'll be good. Yes, Mr. Kennedy, please. Thank you. Ms. Rockema, the, the violation that you referred to involving uh, the Robin Hood matter, all of those allegations are currently covered under federal criminal statutes, everything that's been surfaced to date. In the event of a, a HUD employee uh, giving information to an outsider in advance of public disclosure for money, that presently is covered under our bribery statutes. In the event that a HUD employee, whether or not he gives uh, information for money or not, gives confidential U.S. government documents, witness the ill win situation at the Pentagon, insider information at HUD, that is, in effect, theft of government property. That is covered also by our criminal statutes. What Secretary Kemp seeks is another layer, if you will, on top of that to give him the authority to apply civil penalties up to $10,000 per violation, even upwards of a million dollars, 10000 per violation. In what kinds of circumstances? That would be, be specific? In a, in a circumstance where any of the HUD programs, that is the regulations or the statute, is violated, but without any existing criminal statute to cover it. For example, in the, at the present time, we have really two extremes. We have the ability to, in effect, outlaw conduct under the criminal statutes, prosecute somebody, or, as in the case of the coinsurance program, take somebody out of the program by limited denial of participation. But that huge chasm in the middle, that middle ground, right. we don't have the kind of tools that Secretary Kent needs to wrap knuckles with civil penalties, as is the case in many other departments and agencies of the government. But now, are you saying that the legislation that you proposed would cover those instances as civil? That's with correct. With civil penalties. The package that the Secretary Excellent. sent to OMB yesterday does cover all of the conduct that I believe that you're concerned about with criminal penalties. Our point is the existing criminal statutes would cover the other conduct with criminal penalties. Well, thank you. That is very helpful. I, I yeah, we, like to yield to my uh, colleague from Massachusetts. Just briefly, I, given the uh, criminal penalties that you are, uh, the references that you've just made, why aren't some of the higher up people at HUD in the previous administration being prosecuted under those statutes? They Mr. Kennedy, I can say as a former U.S. attorney, it takes a long time sometimes for criminal cases to be put together. Uh, all of the information that Mr. Adams presented to Secretary Kent, all of the allegations of misconduct, wrongdoing, program abuse that were presented to uh, Secretary Kent, after our review for the purpose of implementing a comprehensive report, reform package, that information was given to the Justice Department immediately to the uh, appropriate officials at the Justice Department for the purpose of review for criminal prosecution, if warranted, and that is their uh, decision. Uh, will yield. Uh, um, the, um, there is some question about um, whether uh, justice has been moving aggressively enough. There are many who feel that they have been, that they're being prudent in terms of their investigation. There are others who feel that there may be a need for a special prosecutor, but. Uh, but there is no dispute about the, the fact that they are under criminal liability. Well, yes, the, the public integrity section of the Justice Department is, uh, I think, one of the very credible groups at Justice, and they have all of this material at the present time. Uh, in our view, and Secretary Kemp has said as much in the, in the recent past, in our view, the Justice Department is moving uh, properly and appropriately to review the allegations and to determine if, in fact, criminal prosecution is warranted. But that, of course, ultimately is their decision. Indication saying that the Justice Department didn't feel that there were uh, criminal uh, prosecutions that were going to come out of this scandal. I, I mean, I'm maybe Mr. Keating thing. could ask that. It, it was my understanding. Is is the gentleman from Massachusetts correct that justice has disavowed any? question of, I thought it was still under review. I think they Congressman Kennedy is correct as to the original materials that were provided. There was a decision at least apparently made public uh, casually or officially or otherwise, I don't know, that uh, there was not enough to warrant criminal prosecution at that time. But as the, the member is well aware, there are other facts that are being developed. I know uh, a number of committees are examining allegations. My question for a second. I'd be happy Mr. to yield. Keating, if, if you've been a, a former U.S. attorney, then it doesn't seem to me that you're going to stand in the way of a bunch of bureaucratic gobbledygook if there are people that have violated the law, that have taken money from HUD, that have taken taxpayers' money and abused it, and going through the exact same statutes that you just went through in, in answer to Mrs. Rockman's questions. You indicate that you're going to be able to prosecute people like 
uh, th th or anybody that was dealing in inside information at HUD. Now, it seems to me that if you have p people that are much higher up than the people that Mrs. Rockma was talking about, who are in fact doing that, then I, if you ha are a former U.S. attorney, simply because you're sending it over to the Department of Justice and finding that they're doing the slowdown on it, it seems to me you've got an obligation to this committee to indicate specifically what's going on with these particular individuals and whether or not prosecutions are going to be moving forward. Let's not hand it over to Department of Justice if they're putting out pu uh, press releases saying that they don't feel that, that they've got enough information to go after the well, individuals Mr. that are Mr. abusing Kennedy, I don't think law. it's fair to describe uh, you know, a referral to the Justice Department of all of the facts developed by the Inspector General as bureaucratic gobbledygook. That happens to be... I, it, sir, you just reviewed with me the, the fact system. that... You just reviewed with me the fact that you've read in the newspaper as well as I've read in the newspaper that they don't feel that they've got uh, the muscle to move no. forward on those prosecutions. No. And you have also sat here and told us about how these abuses have taken place. And it does seem to me that it, it, what that... the 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 normal process is you can say whether it's bureaucratic gobbledygook or not. The point is whether or not these individuals are going to be prosecuted. And it seems to me that you have people that were abusing this system at HUD are going to be prosecuted. And don't tell me that you've just sent it over to DOJ. That is your responsibility, not Department of Justice. That's your responsibility. And it's this committee's responsibility to make sure you do your job. No, it's not my responsibility. Let me, let me no. explain. The, the, the reality is that all of the information that the Inspector General developed, all of the information that we reviewed, all of the information that suggested program abuse, misconduct, and incompetency is addressed in the Secretary's comprehensive reform package, legislative, regulatory, administrative. Those facts which could suggest, suggest the authority for criminal prosecution, and there were very few of them at the time the Inspector General's reports were developed and given to us, were referred to the Public Integrity Section of the Justice Department for further review and action. They make the decision. Grand juries determine whether or not prosecution is in order. The Justice Department determines whether or not prosecution is justified. What we do, as responsible to this committee, is to clean up the muss at HUD, not to prosecute anybody, and we are in the process of doing precisely the former. Well, it seems yes. to me, I'll revert back, but it seems to me that you have a distinct responsibility as a chief law enforcement at that agency to make darn well certain that the people that you're working with that are abusing that agency and abusing the taxpayer's trust are in fact going to be prosecuted. And to slough it off to some other agency and say it's their job, I think is an outrage. No, 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 we're not sloughing it off to anybody. And we are, and we'll continue to work with them to make sure that justice is done. I assure you of that, Mr. Kennedy. Fine. Thank you. Reclaiming my time, I think I understand what uh, Mr. Keating has said, and um, the only I understand what the, my colleague is saying here. The only reservation I have, I'm not a member of uh, a standing member of the uh, oversight committee that is investigating this uh, issue, nor am I a member of the judiciary. But it is my understanding that Mr. Lantos. Um, never questioned the role of, of the Justice Department here and that it was their uh, jurisdiction and absent that then they might pursue uh, the question of a, a special prosecutor. Mr. Frank may know more about that than I but uh, thank you Mr. Keating. I uh, appreciate your, your uh, information. Thank you. I think, uh, in all fairness though to the witness, uh, when did you become counsel Mr. Keating? I came over roughly uh, uh, the 1st of March and was confirmed in June. This year? Yes, that's correct. Well, uh, I didn't want the inference, uh, and I think without meaning that, uh, Mr. Kennedy may have raised an inference to parties not having a chance to follow the uh, course of events too carefully, that you were on board at a time at the time uh, the occurrences referred to took place and i wanted to make sure the record showed you weren't that uh, you're on board now with uh, a new uh, charge as you say as of march or june also the fact is that mr lantos was quoted over the weekend as saying that uh, he was uh, positive that people would be going to jail. Now, what the basis of that statement was, I can't tell you. I haven't seen the newspaper story that Mr. Kennedy alludes to. And uh, not having that knowledge, 
I don't know what the Justice Department is referring to precisely as to what they don't think is uh, uh, subject to prosecution. However, our experience with this committee and the subcommittee on housing in the past has been that in the course of uh, gathering testimony here and elsewhere, such as Milwaukee, Chicago, Flint, Michigan, we did adduce testimony indicating some criminal culpability. We then at that point referred it to the Inspector General. HUD had not had an Inspector General uh, since its inception. That was something that grew later. Before that, we had hearings um, in, in the Small Business uh, Committee, and uh, we came across uh, a news testimony that showed criminal culpability. We made a direct referral to Justice Department. Uh, Mr. Keating is correct, Mr. Kennedy. Uh, there's nothing he can do about prosecuting. He has to refer. I know what you mean by following through, but giving the hierarchical definition of jurisdiction, even if Mr. Keating felt that people should be prosecuted, that decision rests exclusively over in the Justice Department. Well, Mr. Chairman, if I could beg to disagree to some uh, extent, I think that it's fine that there is a bureaucratic system in place that says that the prosecutions are handled by the Department of Justice. But nevertheless, if Mr. Keating is aware of individuals that have broken the law at HUD and sees that there's another federal agency that is not doing its job, after all, this is a political scandal. It's a scandal that was done by an administration. And that administration also appoints the individuals in charge of making these decisions at the, at the Department of Justice. And for us to sit as the authorizing committee, to sit back and let an internal governmental process take place without oversight by elected officials that have a direct responsibility to the individuals of this country that vote for us and don't vote for us, then it seems to me we're abandoning our responsibility. And so what I'm trying to suggest is, I'm not saying, and I didn't mean to imply that Mr. Keating was there at the time of, that, the, that the abuses took place. I don't think that's really relevant. I do think that it's relevant that, that this was a scandal that took place uh, by the individuals involved in that administration, involved in the administration at HUD, that, <laughs> that we have a responsibility. Everybody's here today talking about the reforms that HUD's going to make. But the essential reforms could have been made and could have been done without any involvement of this committee. These are essentially regulations that are going to be changed at HUD. And it, it, and it involves a, an essential trust between the, ex the executive branch and the legislative branch. And that trust has been broken. And what I'm trying to suggest, sir, is that it is incumbent upon the individuals at HUD, if, we're going to tr if one branch of this government is going to trust the other, to make certain that those prosecutions are in fact followed. Mr. Through. Chairman, Chairman you well, I respectfully well, ask whose time are we on? The uh, gentleman well, has made actually, an excellent political statement actually, on his own behalf, I, and I think we know where he stands on the issue. Well, actually, I yielded I to Mr. Kennedy. I have the time. I, I took the time. And Mr. the reason was to clarify and make sure that no witness answering our summons would be in any way placed under a cloud, unintentional or not, uh, that wasn't fair. Uh, I think uh, I've always been very jealous of that. I think, in, in just a minute, I think, uh, uh, Mr. Kennedy, with all due respect, I know where you're coming from. I share your sentiments. Um, even before you came on board, I had been quite cast in the role of a, of a, um, opponent to the then Secretary of HUD. Uh, but we nevertheless persisted, and we did have oversight. In fact, you're involved now in what would be considered oversight responsibility, so that no matter how much we would want to, though, we have to exist and coexist within the limitations of the Constitution. And the legislative branch is co-equal, separate, and independent, but nevertheless, not superior to the executive branch. 
And the executive branch is that branch under the Constitution that is charged with faithfully executing the laws. And that implies implementing the criminal statutes and prosecuting those culpable of uh, transgressions. But I think that in your enthusiasm, uh, you have uh, confused the proper uh, jurisdiction and the limits attached thereto. Uh, we may think that uh, we know that all of this that's now being publicized happened during a past administration. But I think the inference would be wrong if we were to say that. I've always said that corruption is bipartisan. Every time a particular partisan approach was used, either by those in or out of power, uh, alleging the wrongdoing of the opposite party, whether it was in power or not, usually when it was in power, because those seeking power will use that. It turns out that one, once in power, the same thing happened with that administration. I think the best illustration goes back to the time of uh, President Truman and President Eisenhower. Truman, you will remember, no, you were, weren't born then, but Truman had his uh, assistant, forget his name, Donovan or somebody, and he was accused of 5% uh, selling influence at 5%. Eisenhower came into power, and pretty soon he had Sherman Adams at 15%. So that corruption is bipartisan. And what we have here now is a new administration. Yes, Mr. Kemp was part of this body at a time when all of this was going on. He wasn't a member of this committee. Yes, it was uh, the other party that was in power. But I think that we have to keep always limpidly clear what the correct constitutional grant of power is inherent in each one of these um, organs of our government. I think that for you to say that unless Mr. Keating personally prosecutes or implies that, that somehow or other he's in default is quite unfair uh, because that is Chairman, not the Mr. fact. Chairman, yes. you yield? Well, let, I'll give Mr. <laughs> rebuttal time to Mr. Kennedy. Well, I won't take much rebuttal time. I just will say that I disagree with you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, I will take... Uh, All right, now, Mr. Well, well, Mr. Chairman, I don't know where we are in the questioning process, but uh, uh, I think that... Uh, I think what uh, Mr. Kennedy is concerned about is a concern that we all have, and that is that here we are with a whole package of new law, new administrative change. And what we are concerned about is enforcing the existing laws. And we find uh, uh, in many of these instances that there were laws, there were rules, and uh, we want to see the diligent uh, 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 prosecution of those existing laws. These, uh, these funds. Uh, had uh, programs and limits in them. And I think that that's imperative. Before we go off and rewrite the law, we ought to know what's wrong with the ones that, uh, that we do have. And I think there's a tendency here to say, well, the law is deficient, and uh, uh, therefore we're going to take care of this by passing more laws. And I think that that, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, is not appropriate. Uh, I, think we, uh, uh, I think that's really what we're all concerned about. I don't care if they're Democrats, Republicans. I don't think Mr. Kennedy injected that in here. He said that there are some problems. We want to see them resolved, passing them to the Justice Department. Mr. Chairman, you well remember my little episode uh, in the last administration with an improperly awarded UDAG grant. And they passed that over to the Justice Department, and the Justice Department finally recovered the money. I wasn't very happy about it. There wasn't, uh, uh, and I know that the Chairman and others assisted me on this committee in that process. And finally, we uh, were able to, uh, but it wasn't, it isn't easy for us to do it. Someone says, why Congress discovered these problems? I think we're still in uh, discovery stage. I'm, I think I'm under my time, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Uh, Bento I'm under my time. time. Yeah, he's still And uh, uh, I hadn't planned to make another uh, uh, comment, but I think the fact is we're still in a discovery process. 
We're still in a, uh, we're still in a prosecution process, I guess, at Justice Department with regards to these issues. Uh, the Congress uh, did uh, do its job uh, and has in the past, but it's not an easy or simple task. And I, I think that to run in here and say we're going to change all of these laws now because somehow they're deficient uh, is, uh, is not necessarily correct. And we really haven't understood the, the magnitude. And finally, I might repeat again what I said uh, in my early comments is we don't know what the policies are so to, you know, that we're going to be trying to administer. So trying to improve now would be a static uh, uh, method uh, in terms of whatever new policies we develop in housing. So I think these must go through. I commend the, the Secretary and the staff for what they've done. I think that they should do administratively what they can. But we do have these two other problems with new policy changes that are not in place that are likely to be approached. The second problem is prosecuting uh, the law. And the third, of course, if I can add a third problem, we have to find out what the magnitude of this problem is. We're not done. Uh, until we have, uh, have concluded that. And uh, our colleague, Mr. Lantos, and others on the other committee, to some extent our own, have been involved in plumbing the depths of that. And unfortunately, uh, the news has not been very good. I know that you've sought and received some changes in, in other areas. And I'd yield to the gentleman from Massachusetts if he had any. I know he was seeking recognition a moment ago. Mr. Oh, okay. The chair well, intends to recognize him in his own right. Well, Mr. Chairman, I would, uh, I, he's been waiting and others are here before me, so I won't uh, uh, proceed with questions at this time. Thank well, you, you have Mr. about half a minute, but I was going to ask you to yield. I would yield to you, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to say that uh, there's no disagreement. Uh, first place, we don't have in bill form the Secretary's proposals yet, so we don't know exactly what legislative recommendations we have until we see the particulars of the bill. We hope before the day's out, we'll have it. Mr. Wiley and I Mr. Uh, have... What is the day today? Is today uh, October the, uh, the 13th, well, the 12th, the 13th? Well, 12th, Columbus Day. Well, I, uh, we're, uh, we're planning about another month and a half session, Mr. Chairman. Oh, uh, I don't know. I don't know that anybody knows uh, how long we'll be in before we adjourn sign a die, or rather adjourn for, uh, for this uh, first session. Uh, I would say, though, that until we have that bill, we won't know what specifically the Secretary is asking us by way of legislation. We, in the meanwhile, are not going to stop the uh, further consideration of our uh, reauthorization package, uh, which is uh, ready for markup. Um, okay, Steve. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Chairman, I, I do issue my apologies to the gentleman from Minnesota. I had completely lost track of who had the time, and uh, and uh, and I apologize for interrupting him a moment ago. I didn't realize that it would, that he was uh, at that point on his time. Uh, I first want to say to both the uh, Under Sec Deputy Secretary and General Counsel, I think this is a positive day. I'm I uh, generally supportive, as I think most of this committee is, of the legislation that you're proposing uh, to reform the processes at HUD. I'm impressed by the. Uh, introduction of sunshine and accountability at, at HUD by the elimination of some and I would hope it's at some point would be of all discretionary funds and change all discretionary funds back to formula <coughs> grants by the introduction of r some rather uh, severe uh, financial management uh, 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 proposals that are long overdue at HUD and by targeting low and moderate income families uh, with uh, CDBG money and with other HUD uh, proposals. I do have some specific questions on the legislation. Uh, first, as I read your legislation, I see that I believe that you're seeking to overturn what, as my understanding, was a court case called the Rainier View Court Case, uh, and thus your legislation would seek to require only a market analysis of rents of several of the of, of the of the project-based assistance that were granted some 15 uh, years ago or so, and stop comparability analysis first. Can you tell us, is that your intent in this legislation? And if so, would you, would you, would you give us your reasons for that? <clears throat> Ms. Bartlett, if I, could, uh, if I could attempt to take that briefly for you, uh, we're not attempting to overrule a court case per se. Uh, the litigants in that court case, the plaintiffs, have been paid. What we are attempting to do is to stop the hemorrhaging that will cost uh, the taxpayers upwards of a billion and a half dollars over the course of the next 10 years for the payment of what we see as windfall payments in excess of what fair market rents, including comparability, should be. The Rainier View case that you refer to was a Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals case in California in which the, the court decided that HUD was wrong in the way we were setting our 
fair market rents and attempting to factor in comparability, that is, what does the market bear in that particular area? We believe we should be able to factor in comparability because to pay people 120% of market plus more on top of that is an excessive windfall. It's inappropriate, as Secretary Kemp said when he was explaining his concern about this issue. It takes uh, from low and moderate income Americans from the traditional needs of HUD a large body of cash. We think that uh, to pay the the Ninth Circuit decision in the Ninth Circuit could cost us as much as $300 million. To pay it across the United States could cost us upwards of $600 million to a billion. We're not sure. At this time, we do need help from the Congress because we think that to pay people a fair rent to provide for low and moderate income is one thing, but to pay people an excess rent, to pay people a windfall, is inappropriate. So your, your legislation would change existing law to provide for only comparability and, and uh, I'm sorry, for only uh, market analysis and not for comparability uh, uh, standards. That, that's your proposal. Well, we, we are attempting to clarify the law to permit comparability to be a factor. That's correct, Mr. Barber. Second question, would you intend for that to be retroactive uh, or effective on the date of enactment from this day forward, or would you, would you use the uh, uh, comparability uh, and, and market analysis for prior, uh, uh, for re retroactive? Mr. Bar Mr. Bartlett, that, of course, would be up to this committee and the Congress. We would hope that it would be retroactive. You, so your proposal is to make it retroactive back to what date? Uh, I'm not sure what the day is, uh, uh, Mr. Bartlett, but probably from the date of the, the decision, prospectively. From the date of Re Rainier View? Yes. Or but from I'm, the I'm date not exactly of, okay. positive what that particular we'll threshold is. Yeah, I, I just caution you. You may have some difficulty. I would hope you'd have some difficulty with Congress in adopting a retroactive uh, uh, application of the law, but obviously we'll, we'll look at it when it comes up here. And third, you're, you're telling us that you, you're not certain what the cost would be. I've, I've seen three or four different estimates, somewhere between 200 million and, and your highest estimate this morning was one and a half billion. What, what, when will you have a handle on what these costs would be? Well, the best estimates that we have, and I was speaking just a minute ago with Mr. Edson, whom I know represents a number of the plaintiffs who disagrees as to the figure, but the best estimate we have is 130 to 150 million within the Ninth Circuit, uh, upwards of 600 to 900 million throughout the United States retroactively, and then prospectively upwards of a billion and a half dollars. Okay. The next question is, uh, you, you propose the elimination of discretionary programs of some types in this legislation. I want to pin that down for a minute. Are you proposing, the only specifics I see, but it may be more, are you proposing the elimination of those accounts that are known as the secretary's discretionary funds, or are you, would you propose the elimination of discretionary projects in general, uh, and a movement of HUD of HUD funding over to a uh, formula a formula grant? Mr. Bartlett, we want to do two things. We want to eliminate the discretionary fund itself, uh, but in the other programs, the housing programs, we want to eliminate the headquarters reserve, which was used as a discretionary fund. Uh, for uh, discretionary purposes. We believe the money, the benefits, should be allocated on a fair share formula basis uh, to the localities or uh, on the basis of competition. There may be a need for special initiatives. We had one operation bootstrap that the Secretary proposed, which was a new initiative uh, that, that he proposed. But we want to have clear criteria laid out laid out before the funds are set aside at the beginning of the fiscal year so that everyone knows what the rules of the game are, how they're going to be played, what the, and what the uh, rating and ranking system is going to be. You would leave some discretionary funding in the HUD program, but you would try to limit it and you would make it, it, it let me see if I understand, you would, you would convert it to an open competition announced at the beginning of the year. As I, the reason for my question is, is much of the controversy came from the mod rehab programs which were so which were which were purported to have been competitively bid but we come to find out uh, the competition was in a there was uh, no was competition in mod rehab we all know you know I think the facts speak for themselves although uh, we've now heard the, the pro uh, people say that there was a, comp a competitive process we have found not a scintilla of evidence that there was any competition in the way those funds were awarded so we're uh, to either A, eliminate mod rehab, which 
frankly, I think would be a good we, idea. We have included in this proposal the termination of the Mod Rehab Program. It is discredited. It didn't work. Even where it was used, it, didn't, uh, it wasn't efficient. Uh, and uh, we believe that uh, its time has come and gone. So you would propose to eliminate Mod Rehab and to, move, and to eliminate all the discretionary funds that you can and the ones that you can't, then in your proposal you would propose to set it up on a competitive process that is the competitive rules are set at the beginning of the year and not engineered for each individual and grant. That's correct, Mr. Bartlett. And those competitive situations would be uh, the exception rather than the rule. The general rule is going to be to fair share it with a formula. There are certain programs which are so small that they just don't work. If we divide all the units to every community in America, uh, a small city may end up with two or three units and they can't do anything with them. It would be very helpful to this committee when you submit the legislation and we could hold the record open. If you could submit to us uh, that list of those exceptions that would continue to be a, a, a competitive process and a summary description in lay language as to how you would ensure it be a competitive process. And, and Mr. Chairman, if I have a I don't. Time of the gentleman has expired. Mr. We'll be Frank. pleased to submit that yeah. material for the record. I'll try to get my questions. I will get mine before we vote. I want to make sure we um, sum up that way. One of the problems we have in dealing with the reforms only and not other substance, to me, comes up when you talk about one of the reforms you propose is to abolish the mod rehab program. Is there going to be in the proposal an alternative suggestion yeah, as to what to do with that money? That's right. The, uh, the money that was used for the Mod Rehab Program would be, the certificates would be used for one of the other programs that we believe are working. The reform package have to make that decision. In other words, if as part of the reform package we're terminating a particular program that gets money into low-income housing, unless we're prepared to have a gap of some period, we've got to figure a different place to put it, I mean, inevitably. Well, the, the uh, funding of the Mod Rehab Program at about $250 million uh, uh, was, uh, was, was uh, there, there are more than enough initiatives. The Secretary asked for uh, uh, $50 million for homeless programs, $44 million for, uh, for a new home ownership so program. We didn't that. receive that. So we have plenty of recommendations, well, Mr. But Frank. You are, but you are then agreeing with me that as part of the reform package, there would be some new authorization. I mean, we would have to decide. Or are you saying that not necessarily? There are there are a number of programs that we have already authorized that we could fund more well, adequately. Would the legislation be silent on that, and it would just be the secretary's decision where to put the money. No, it would obviously be the Congress's uh, uh, that's decision. That's my point. Is that uh, the, the, the separation? But I, I'm not saying it's a hard decision to make. I'm saying it's a decision to make that if we're going to decide not to spend money here, we ought to decide to spend it elsewhere. But I, I have a more fundamental question here, and that's um, Secretary Kemp has been a great advocate during his political career of the importance of putting the free enterprise system to work. And I don't want to lose that. Uh, and I'm, uh, for instance, on page 11, you talk about uh, preventing the layering of subsidies by having people do double dipping with the low-income tax credit, et cetera. Now, I agree, in some cases, that has led to abuse. On the other hand, I think a no double dipping at all rule will re result in an under usage of it. And I mean, I. We you know, fully agree, Mr. Frank. Frank. We want to have the tax credit to be available to make the deal happen, but not, as the Secretary so the said, to make 11, which talks the to, I'm sorry if I missed it. Profits. We had the Attorney General in on the Americans with Disabilities Act. And, I, and, and then later on it talks about a redirection back to the poor, the tenants, community-based nonprofits, et cetera. I'm for that, but we don't run any other Department of Government that I'm familiar with wholly on a nonprofit basis. Maybe the State Department gives its money to nonprofit entities called other countries, although a couple of them have gotten profitable. But the Defense Department doesn't, isn't asked to only deal with nonprofits, and the Commerce Department isn't, and HHS isn't, the drug companies aren't. Um, I don't want to lose part of the problem I think we've run into, and I think we overdid the cutbacks in the tax credit, and I think the Secretary agrees there, um, even though OMB doesn't like him to agree as much as he does. And I think we did it also with regard to some of these programs. That is, and that may be one of the things that we were talking about with Section 8 uh, on fair market rents. That is, we can't order people to invest their money in low-income housing. We can't put up all the money out of the Treasury. We need to have incentives that are going to have private sector people put up money. And I, I, I just want to make clear that we agree that we don't want to overreact to the abuses. There have been some abuses by discouraging it. We can't do it all with nonprofits, and we can't do it all with charity. There is a legitimate role for a set of both tax incentives and government matching programs that do provide incentives to the free enterprise system. And I, 
I, I, some things taken here could have gone the other way. I want to make sure that we, we, we agree on that. Mr. Frank, I want to assure you that the Secretary believes there is a legitimate role for the private sector. We believe that that role includes taking some of the risk and having reasonable profits. What we're opposed to is these windfall profits. Agreed. And I, I think you can separate out. I mean, the, the consultants seem to me to be very much uh, unnecessary. And as it came out when we were talking to Mr. Watt, his consultancy fee in that reduced the return of that developer, she testified, basically from about 11 percent to 8 and percent on our equity. Now, the difference between an 11 percent return and an 8 and percent return is probably gets you out of where it makes sense for you to do entrepreneurial work and into where you just put your money somewhere. So there's no question about it. And even if those consultant fees are being paid for by the developer, if we reduce the developer's profit by a set of procedures that require him or her to pay a, pay a consultant, we may be uh, diminishing people, and I, I, I appreciate that. Uh, the last thing I, I would just reiterate what others have said, the uh, basic problems here were not, it seemed to me, statutory. They were uh, personnel. We should go ahead with some statutes, but I don't think anyone ought to, uh, nothing in the law made people do these things wrong. Uh, they volunteered to do them wrong. Particularly, and I think you have to just divide this out, the co-insurance program where it seems to me we lost more money than Mod Rehab, uh, yeah, and there I think it was more statutorily. Uh, we, we should be clear that different programs require different responses. Thank you. Well, I would just uh, respond on the coinsurance program. I think coinsurance uh, uh, is a program that could have worked very well. One of the problems with that program is that all of the risk was left with the government and all of the profits were left in the private and sector. I think there was statutory That's not my idea of privatization. It's not uh, Secretary Kemp's idea. There should be a sharing of both the risk and the, uh, the profits. Well, once again, uh, we want to thank our distinguished member from Massachusetts. I think uh, he's hit the nail right on the head with his incisive points. Now, we have uh, three members that have not had an opportunity to ask questions on their own. Are the witnesses uh, under any time constraints? Would you be able to bear with us if we won and took a vote and came back? Would you prefer that, Mr. Corper? Well, uh, I have some because uh, the main purpose for these hearings today, I felt, would be to show the um, evidentiary need for program restructuring or abolition of program. Up to now, I've had very little because in the case of a moderate Section uh, 8 moderate rehab, I know what the intent was on the part of the Congress, but with the advent of the Reagan administration, we had a departure from the method of allocating. For instance, you very seldom had more than 20 units. It wasn't until these latter days that you had uh, 300, uh, well, those were very, very antithetical in uh, nature to what the congressional intent was. So I'd like to come back and have some testimony uh, so that we can back up as much as possible the legislative recommendations. We'll, be we'll go take something. a vote. The committee will proceed and again thank the two witnesses for being patient being with us and going through the lunch period. Mr. Carper. Thank you Mr. Chairman and again to our witnesses thank you for, uh, for sticking with us. I, uh, a co couple of questions I'd like to, uh, to cover in, in reviewing a, uh, a handout that's entitled uh, Reform of HUD. I, uh, I read through it fairly carefully and it uh, is in our sidebar conversation you've indicated that the, uh, this package really looks uh, uh, retrospectively, it looks at the past, it looks at the problems that, uh, that you've inherited and are endeavoring to try to, to clean up, in some cases with our assistance. The, uh, one of the problems that uh, we did not resolve um, earlier this year is the issue of preservation. We essentially punted, we put off until next February, the day of decision, on how to, uh, how to ensure that, uh, in some cases, hundreds of thousands of people who are in uh, units around the, the country, how they might not end up out on the street and uh, we're going to be faced again in the next couple of weeks, maybe next two months, three months, what to do. 
about this issue. I don't want us to have to punt again. I want us to work out a compromise, something that you folks are satisfied with or happy with. And I'm wondering if you could give us today the benefit of your thinking on uh, the issue of preservation and what we do between now and February to, to address it and not to sidestep. Mr. Carper, uh, Secretary Kemp sees the reform in, in two efforts. This that we're here discussing today, he refers to as clearing the decks, and that's exactly what we wish to do, to clear the decks so that we can then look prospectively at a new authorization uh, and dealing with problems such as uh, the prepayment, the preservation issue. As you know, the Congress has uh, placed uh, severe uh, requirements on uh, mortgage uh, uh, prepayments. Uh, those uh, uh, restrictions go till February of 1990. We are developing proposals that we believe will protect the tenants and the rights of the owners. And we want to work with the Congress uh, uh, when we present them uh, very shortly. We hope that we will be able to uh, come up with a set of proposals for your consideration uh, that will enable a resolution of this issue before the February uh, deadline is reached. But in the event that we do not, we may need a brief uh, uh, extension. However, it is our intention to resolve this issue. I've encouraged uh, the chairman of our full committee to, uh, to bring an authorization bill that would include the reforms that you folks have outlined to bring that uh, before a subcommittee markup by the end of this month. I further encourage them to bring the, uh, the bill before the full banking committee uh, by the end of November and in hopes that we would have a banking or rather housing bill on the floor once we come back in January, late January, early February. I think it's important that the uh, prepayment issue, that the uh, preservation issue be addressed. Uh, again, I would urge you to, to move with all due speed. I know you've uh, inherited a can of worms. You have your hands full trying to deal with those issues. This is another important issue that's facing us. We, Again, we put it off once. I uh, don't want us to, to, to do that again. And I would just uh, say, uh, to the extent that you can divert some of your attention to this, please, please do. Second Mr. issue. Mr. Carper, if I just may respond yeah. to that. We are very concerned about moving a reform package, clearing the decks. We understand the need to deal with preservation. We understand that next year there's a need to deal with a reauthorization. You are correct in pointing out that we have inherited a can of worms. And it is absolutely necessary that we stop those worms from eating the fruit of the HUD program and destroying the program underway. We believe reform needs to be passed as soon as possible so that we can clear the decks and deliver the programs that we now have, uh, have authorized and underway. It would be a tragedy if our effort to clean up HUD is derailed while we wait for the legislative process, which is not always the fastest process. And I say that with all due respect. I was a state legislator in New York State. I understand that there are two houses in this process, uh, and it's a very complicated process. And I would hate to see our reform effort, our effort to stop the Robin Hoods, our effort to stop the ripoffs uh, derailed while we wait for some new authorization of an expensive program that is yet to be uh, developed. I noted. Uh, that in the other house just last week, uh, the majority announced a whole new task force to figure out what they want to do about a reauthorization. And that's their right uh, if that's the way they approach it. But we cannot wait. Uh, we cannot delay cleaning up the, uh, uh, the programs that now exist while we wait for the new task force report. We, I think, in the Congress have waited patiently while Mr. Kemp put together his team. And I think it's a good team. Uh, we've waited patiently. We've waited for you folks to develop your legislative initiatives. Now that uh, we're receiving those, uh, we've been literally holding up, I think, the, the markup of our housing bill in anticipation uh, of your input. We're now beginning to receive that input. Uh, I hope we go forth uh, on a two-track process at, uh, at the same time. Uh, and again, the, the kind of uh, schedule I would hope for and have encouraged uh, Mr. Gonzalez to pursue is, is, a, is a markup that would have us out of the banking committee by the end of November and onto the House floor earlier next year. Can I just mention one other thing, different issue, and it's a uh, matter of CDBGs. I, uh, I'm just going to ask you to, to take a minute and, and use a real simple example so that we might all understand it. Explain how the uh, CDBG program now works in terms of the uh, low or mod requirements for, uh, for applying the funds, how it works now, why that is not the best of all worlds, and how you might change it. And again, I'm going to ask you to, to do so uh, by the use of an example. Let me just uh, begin by explaining the program. It is a uh, largely block 
grant program, as the name implies, the localities have broad discretion for what they can spend the federal funds on, what activities they can use those federal funds now. And basically, uh, they are allowed to spend up to 40 percent of those funds on activities which may be worthwhile and certainly are legal, but that do not benefit low and moderate income people. Uh, we want to change that 40 percent uh, to 25 percent. In other words, what Secretary Kemp is proposing to do is instead of having 60 percent of the money go to low and moderate income people, he wants to raise it to 75 percent. And the reason is that we feel very strongly that the needs of poor people, the needs of housing in, in, in the, the old neighborhoods come higher and at a higher level than replacing sidewalks. Let me explain to you, to give you some examples of the kinds of activities that we do not believe are as high a priority as helping the poor people. Uh, for instance, $141,000 uh, uh, was used to create community gardens from vacant lots in a neighborhood that had terribly run down housing. That should have been used for housing. Seven and a half million dollars of loans were used to uh, rehabilitate apartments that were not occupied by low and moderate income people in New York City. Uh, facade improvements, uh, $718,000 for, uh, for uh, improving buildings that were not occupied by low-income uh, uh, people. We have uh, improved and constructed restroom facilities at baseball stadiums. Now, certainly uh, no one would argue with the need for restroom facilities at baseball stadiums, but the question is, is that what a poverty program is supposed to do? It's these kinds of activities. We spent $17,000 <coughs> to construct barns for horses uh, uh, in, uh, in Los Angeles. Now, the horses in Los Angeles may very well have needed barns, but that is not the kind of housing that Jack Kemp believes our money should be spent on, and we want to target it to the poor people, to the housing needs of people, not horses. Would the gentleman yield? You're on to something there, and, and I've asked some questions, and uh, we've gone over this road before on the Community Development Block Grant, the discretionary aspect of it, and you're talking about increasing uh, to 75 percent the overall low mod benefit requirement from 60 percent. But at no time uh, during the discussion this morning have I heard anything said about to provide more effective targeting of funds in more affluent, affluent communities by requiring 100 percent of all the activities in low mod benefit objective. And that's the part of it that concerns me more than uh, increasing the 60 to 75 percent in the overall low mod benefit requirement. I don't know if the uh, gentleman from Delaware was getting to that aspect of it or not. Actually, what I was, was gonna, where I was going to go, Mr. Wiley, was uh, another part of the proposal. I understand uh, the, the terms uh, proportional accounting figure into the uh, pro proportional accounting uh, figures into the, uh, the recommended, recommended changes for CDBGs. And I'm not, it's not altogether clear to me how that, I, I understand the increase from, uh, or the decrease from 40 percent to 25 percent in terms of, of, of uh, the amount of monies that can be used to serve uh, other than lower middle income groups. But the term proportional accounting uh, is. Well, the, the current counting methods that are used uh, uh, under the regulations uh, do result in, uh, uh, because you have to understand, a given census tract or a neighborhood or even a project, a particular building, may not benefit only low-income people because there may be a mix in that particular project. And so we find that even with a 60 percent requirement, uh, some communities are only actually benefiting 50 percent uh, poor people. All right, well, there's a, uh, let me just let me back up again. Currently, uh, it's my understanding that it must be substantiated that something like 51 percent of the residents of an area uh, that are served with CDBG funds uh, are lower income. That's correct. Once that is uh, substantiated, this entire project uh, can, as I understand it, be applied to the overall low mod uh, requirement. That is also correct. That 60 percent of the CDBG funds be used to serve low and moderate income people. That's, as I understand it, the way that the program currently works. And what I understand is that uh, Secretary Kemp is interested in increasing the overall low mod uh, benefits to 75 percent, as you've indicated, and supports the concept of, quote, proportional accounting, close quote, whereby if a project serves only, we will say, 52 percent of the low, moderate, moderate income people, only 52 percent of the project could be applied to the overall 
low mod benefit. Now that's, that's what I don't understand, and I was hoping you could explain to me and to, to the others on the committee. Well, the and what I was asking you to do was to, to use a simple example well, in explaining the, how uh, that might work. You're going to test my mathematical skills, but uh, it may be that one Use around there, a, a, a uh, dollar, a hundred dollars, a, a million well, dollars. Well, let uh, let's, let's try two $100 projects. All right. Uh, one may benefit low-income people 100%. The other may benefit low-income people 40%. So of the $200, 140 is benefiting low-income people. That would be 70% benefiting low-income people. And that would pass the 60% threshold, but it would not pass the 75% threshold. If, on the other hand, you had two projects, one for $100 and it was benefiting 100% low-income people, and the other for $100 and it was benefiting 10% low-income people, that would be $110 going to low-income, that would be 55% of the benefits, and that would not meet the 60% threshold. So it's, it's a mixing. We do look at the total program of the projects and, and the benefits uh, in, the app, in, the, uh, uh, in the program of projects for that year. Yeah. Right, my time is expired. Let me just ask, if, if, Mr. Chairman, if, if I could just ask that uh, you look a bit more closely at what, I, what I'm trying to get to and the notion of proportional accounting. And if you can, uh, you find that there's something that, that you need to be saying to me that you haven't said here and would share that in writing, I would be most uh, appreciative. And again, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The chair re uh, recognizes a uh, distinguished colleague, uh, Mr. Novak of New York, uh, Novak, and uh, since he was um, one of those initially uh, bringing to the attention of the committee the uh, questions arising out of the uh, Section 8 moderate rehab, in, I believe, in Buffalo, the chair would like to ask our distinguished colleague if he wishes to be recognized, if he has any statement he'd like to make. Uh, we appreciate your presence here, Henry. <coughs> Uh, I thank the chairman uh, for the courtesy. Uh, certainly, I don't uh, want to take the time of the committee and, uh, and their deliberations directly into uh, uh, HUD at this point in time, but I appreciate the uh, response that we did receive from the committee in looking at the Buffalo problem, which I think has uh, been to some degree uh, addressed by the reforms that have come out of uh, uh, HUD and, uh, and Secretary Kemp. Uh, we would only urge that uh, uh, we look forward to uh, uh, seeing the effect of those reforms and, and the uh, legislation which is forthcoming because I think what happened uh, in Buffalo uh, has happened uh, throughout the country and uh, uh, as the chairman rightfully uh, pointed out that, that he's looking at uh, an overall reform and I would expect uh, that the sp specific instance uh, uh, an impact of the reforms on Buffalo would also serve other cities. So we will be following this uh, with the uh, chairman and with the committee and uh, as we move forward to make sure that that the uh, the reforms do uh, have the desired effect throughout uh, the country. And thank the chairman for his oh, courtesy. Oh, thank you very much, Congressman. That was a very good statement and I'd like to have you consider yourself sort of an associate member of the committee and we will make available to you uh, the uh, material and documentation we have so that you can examine it. We will need your help when we get to the House floor, so we want you to be appointed and also welcome your uh, suggestions. Uh, Mr. Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have uh, a few questions that <coughs> surround specific programs and some of the changes that Mr. Kemp uh, suggested in his uh, written testimony today. One of uh, your proposals, the FHA 18 proposal, would change the requirements governing the disposition of HUD-held or HUD-owned multifamily properties. Your proposal would result in fewer low-income families being helped when FHA sells a property or when HUD sells a property that, uh, uh, that it owns. I 
there, there were some, I think, some factual uh, inaccuracies in the uh, written testimony that would suggest that somehow or another that HUD has only an obligation, or has an obligation rather, to make certain that once those uh, properties come into HUD's ownership, that 100% of those units have to be filled with low-income people. And I would just refer you to, uh, to uh, Subtitle C of the Multifamily Housing Management and Preservation Act, which uh, goes through very specific categories, which would not indicate uh, that this is uh, the way the program uh, works. And the obvious implication, Mr. Delabovi, is that the difficulty is that you're asking us to approve a process where we're getting rid of more units that could go to help poor people. And obviously, Mr. Kemp's indications have been that he wants to make certain that programs are designed now to make sure that poor people are protected. So I just wonder whether or not there aren't additional funds that HUD would have available that can enable you to dispose of these properties, uh, considering the fact that I'm aware of specific instances where you've lowered the price down to seven or $8,000 a unit uh, to make sure that they get out into the private sector. Uh, and those are going to for-profit developers. Well, Mr. Kennedy, the specific proposal uh, that we've, we envision in FHA 18 is designed to deal with the problem that as the law now stands, if we dispose of a property, a multiple dwelling, multifamily property, we have to provide subsidy uh, to go with it in the, in the disposition. There are some markets, and they're not in your district, I can assure you, where the, no subsidy is needed because the uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the market rent is so low, and so subsidy isn't really needed in those in those uh, uh, markets. We yeah, would like to. You be wouldn't able have to, to just w if if if, if the properties are uh, that low in value, then don't, can't the tenants in fact afford the properties? They can, and they do not need subsidy. That's right. Those that's tend right. to be in the Sun Belt, and that's and, the law and that's why we would like we would not like to be forced to provide subsidy there because we would rather take right. the subsidy. But the law does available. not require you to. To provide well, that subsidy, it, it now does. The, no, well, I, I just re referred. To, I mean, it, it, what the the law says <clears throat> that you have to provide. Uh, t the secretary shall not take less than one of the following actions: yeah. either a section eight. Uh, the uh, second would be uh, purchase money mortgages. Thir third would be uh, reducing the selling price, and fourth would be other financial assistance. You know, for instance, we've got a new bill. Uh, here in the Congress, the Community Housing Partnership Act, which would have $500 million that could be used to make sure that those, those properties go into nonprofits and then are permanently in the use of, of low-income people. And it just seems, I mean, the only point I'm trying to make is, you know, we're, we're trying to be helpful in terms of supporting some of the changes. I just want to make certain that we're not inadvertently uh, going to be harmful to poor people as a result of the changes that are being suggested. Mr. Kennedy, you're referring to single-family homes, are you not? No, multi-family. Multi-family, yes, that would sir. be turned over to, to tenant and, and neighborhood uh, yes, sir. groups. If you read the statute, you can review it. We, and, I will make sure that our... Time and, and see the fact that the, there, just, there are just inaccuracies in the testimony today, and I'm just pointing out to you... Well, that we will go back and review that. Statute because as you know, Mr. Kennedy, this, uh, uh, Secretary Kemp believes very strongly, as you do, that we should encourage low-income people, tenants, neighborhood organizations, uh, that kind of thing to get involved and we certainly would not want to leave you with the impression that anything we are going to put in the legislation I, will be an obstacle to that. Yes sir and I'm just pointing out to you some inaccuracies and we that, appreciate that we've that. picked up and so I'm sure you go back and and check them out and, and fix them up. Uh, another question that I have ha pertains to uh, Mr. Kemp's testimony this morning which would indicate that you want to set aside um, uh, a, about uh, I think it was one half of one percent uh, to increase your monitoring on oversight responsibilities. And I would just point out that under the Section 8 program, a $10 billion a year program, uh, that would set aside $50 million to, set, to, to simply monitor that program. Under CDBG, I'm just doing rough uh, back of the envelope math. You do, uh, if that's about a $4 billion program at 5%, that's $20 million. Now, I assume that you're not wanting to spend 10, uh, 50 million on Section 8 and 20 million on CDBG. And uh, the question becomes what, uh, what proper role do we yes. have in terms of, of making sure that those funds aren't being, uh, are being spent wisely? As we envision that, Mr. Kennedy, and it's an excellent point, we would set aside the funds, make them available to be used on a task order basis, but they would not necessarily be used in that particular year. The remaining funds would be recycled later in the year to go out to the, uh, to the beneficiaries. 
uh, to the grantees. Could you, do you think it would be possible to give us a better guesstimate on the specific programs where uh, there are such large dollars involved and, and, what, uh, and a better uh, <coughs> targeted perspective on uh, how much funds will actually be used or needed? Uh, I don't think anybody wants to think that you can yes. spend $100 million to oversee how HUD spends its money. I mean, no, no you're, <laughs> you're absolutely right, and we are developing that information, and we will forward it uh, uh, to the committee as soon as it's, uh, it's available. Uh, we use that as a target uh, 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 suggestion, uh, but uh, it is our intention to conserve whatever funds are available for that monitoring purpose and uh, to use the balance to recycle them in the next year's funding round. By the way, that is done in other federal programs, including some transportation programs that I previously managed. Appreciate that. Uh, <clears throat> my last question has to do, uh, again, with CDBG uh, and the discretionary fund. And as I understood the testimony this morning, uh, the technical assistance funds that are part of the CDBG funding at the moment would be eliminated under the Kemp proposals. And obviously, we don't want to be blaming the victim once again. And, and it seems to me that uh, technical assistance money under CDBG has been effectively used by poor people in the past by, uh, for the purposes of assisting poor people, I should say. say, say. And uh, I wonder why uh, they have to be punished for this, this type of, uh, uh, of abuse. Uh, is there some, do you have some thoughts? Could you explain a little bit more about why the technical assistance portion is going to be denied? Well, the reason we, we wanted to deny the technical assistance portion is, as it is now constituted is that it was a discretionary program subject to abuse. We believe that we can build technical assistance provisions into the other existing programs so that we can still be providing on a competitive basis to qualified local organizations technical assistance, but not do it out of a, uh, a, a central fund. I'll be honest, it was a very tough call. But on balance, we concluded that the only way to eliminate uh, the problems with these discretionary programs was to eliminate the discretion. Mm. Well, I don't think, Mr. Chairman, that we want to uh, continue the possibilities of, of, uh, uh, of, of blatant abuse. On the other hand, I think you're aware that these uh, are projects that have uh, been spent well in the past. And uh, the question would be whether or not uh, you can pr perhaps provide the committee with additional information about how that technical assistance is going to continue to be made available to people so that people don't read the testimony and think that technical assistance is now out the window simply because of the abuses that have taken place in the past. And if you could just uh, perhaps by, between now and the next time you come before the committee prepare for us a better uh, definition of how those changes are going to take place, I'd certainly appreciate it. I certainly will be pleased. We, we will be pleased to do that, Mr. Kennedy, and I want to make clear that we recognize a legitimate role for technical assistance and want to provide it fairly uh, and in a way that it can continue to be effective. That's terrific. And I, the only point I'm trying to make to you is that I would agree with that as a general theory. And the question is going to become how that actually evolves into direct policy. And I, th I, I think the committee's jurisdiction in terms of making certain that that continues in a way that is helpful to uh, the most vulnerable people in the society. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, in, continuing that line of discussion, I'm very much concerned, uh, uh, gentlemen. Uh, the uh, CDBG discretionary fund has been the sole source for uh, our CDBG for the Indians. Uh, the history of our Indian legislation is uh, quite sad. I have been one of the uh, leading proponents uh, even before I became chairman of the Committee on Housing. And uh, it took, I think, until 1970, uh, when was it that we finally had a HUD program for Indian? Yeah, well, I think we specifically provided something in the 1978 Act, if I remember correctly. But that amounts to uh, some $27 million. What are we going to do about this? Uh, we are going to propose that the Indian assistance be provided as a separate Indian program. It would be a separate line item in our budget submission. It would continue, the Indian portion would continue as it now does, but it would no longer be uh, mixed into this uh, uh, slush fund 
uh, of uh, discretion. I see. I see. It would be separated and clearly uh, directed to the purpose, as you pointed out, that is very well intentioned and that, w that, uh, that we want to continue. But we can continue doing those good things without continuing to do them out of the uh, discretionary program, and that's our intention. Well, we want to make sure that we have that uh, definitely provided for. Uh, as far as I know, we haven't had any Indian Debbie Dean. Oh, uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I just, I must share somewhat Mr. Kennedy's uh, concerns there that, and I expressed that at the very outset in uh, general terms in my opening remarks, and that is that uh, we don't want, with the best of intentions, uh, to do away with a program that essentially has, uh, from a programmatic standpoint, has worked. It, it's, um, and, and this uh, bothers me quite a bit, so uh, would that be incorporated in what you hope will be the uh, uh, Secretary's uh, legislative package? Absolutely. We intend to preserve those things that are working. We intend to build upon those successes and cast aside the things that didn't work or the things that discredited the program. Okay. Right. Mr. Hoagland? I, th thank you for recognizing me, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I want to thank the two of you for uh, being here so long and enduring these questions. Uh, particularly, I'd like to thank Secretary Kemp, and I hope you'll convey this to him for me for his recent trip to Omaha. Um, we had a very constructive tour, I think, of our housing authority in Omaha. Uh, Secretary Kemp was in town for about a day or so and made a number of appearances. And it was very beneficial, I think, to the housing community in, um, in Nebraska. Uh, I've, I've reviewed your plan prior to the hearing, and I think it's a good plan, and would like to let you know that, that I, I know many of us on this side of the aisle are eager to help you implement it as quickly as possible. Um, I think we have a lot to learn from the past, and I think you all have, have done a good job of, of putting together a plan that will help us avoid these sorts of problems in the future. Uh, my interest as, as a freshman member of this committee uh, is to, is I, is as much as anything else, to look to the future. Uh, in Omaha, we have a, a small community, small enough that it's the sort of community you can really get your arms around. Uh, we do have some serious <laughs> housing problems, some serious drug problems, some serious poverty problems in Omaha. And I'd be interested in a, in a nuts and bolts briefing from the two of you as to what kind of programs are available at HUD for the future, assuming the passage of your reorganization package, and what sort of, of uh, programs we in Omaha should look towards applying for that might be beneficial in helping us in our long-range goal of solving our <coughs> housing problems and eradicating poverty um, in our part of Nebraska. Mr. Delabovi, maybe you could go first and, and just give sort of a primer basic review of the kind of programs that communities the size of Omaha are eligible to apply for. Well, we envision that uh, certainly uh, the programs in place will continue to meet the needs of public housing residents who live in publicly owned and publicly operated housing. We've proposed uh, uh, very little change in the, in the comprehensive uh, assistance program for those, uh, uh, for those folks. Uh, we continue uh, to believe in the strength of vouchers, though we find that uh, project-based certificates and vouchers led to abuses. We think the tenants uh, should have the right to use those vouchers in the housing of their selection. We don't believe that somebody who's a poor person who gets federal assistance should be sentenced to living in uh, a, a, a project, a project which may become neglected. We have an example of that right here uh, uh, in, in Washington, D.C., at Tyler House, uh, where poor people are, uh, are forced to live in, in, in terrible conditions <laughs> because the, uh, the certificates that they have are only usable in those particular projects. So we see those basic programs continuing, community development block grant with the changes that we've made. Uh, we believe those changes will encourage the kinds of activities that Mr. Wiley uh, referred to uh, uh, and that I saw firsthand in, in Columbus. Uh, we also believe that uh, 
uh, the targeting of community uh, development block grant funds more appropriately to public housing may create may do something about the tragedy we see in Cleveland, where there are thousands of rundown uh, units of, uh, of public housing and uh, and mismanagement. We want to be able to continue to provide technical assistance. The tragedy of homelessness continues to be high on our agenda. We want to match the vouchers with local services that are that are available because we recognize it's not it's not enough for a homeless person. <laughs> to just put a roof over their head and four walls around them. They're probably homeless uh, because of some other crises, some other problems. Mr. Wiley and I saw some of that in Columbus. I was in, in Kansas City yesterday announcing a new pilot program with, uh, uh, with Senator Bond, which will take vouchers and marry them to local services, counseling, education, uh, job training, uh, daycare where necessary, so people can put their lives together and, and get back, back, uh, uh, back on the road to to the American dream that we all share, and that is home ownership for as many Americans of, uh, as is possible. We will continue to promote tenant ownership and, uh, uh, of, uh, and tenant management of existing public housing. We recognize the committee's concern that we not eliminate all rental uh, 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 housing and, and eliminate the availability of it, but we believe that we can help tenants manage the projects, manage their own lives, and get to own their own housing. So those are basically the agenda items that we have set forth. And of course, there's drugs. And I'm going to ask uh, the general counsel, Mr. Keating, to deal with that, since that has been his special area of responsibility that the secretary has designated uh, uh, for him to coordinate completely our anti-drug efforts in the department. Well, as a preface, Mr. Hoagland, to, to my answer, I would say that we would all be well served if we could duplicate uh, Bob Armstrong, your housing authority director throughout the United States, if we had a Bob Armstrong in all 3,300 public housing agencies in America, we would all be much better off. He's an outstanding public official. I know Secretary Kemp uses him as an example, as a symbol of how a properly run, a properly led, a creatively run and led housing authority that should be managed. But one of the things that Secretary Kemp did when he came to HUD was, for the first time, create a drug office, a drug policy office at HUD. He made the director of that office a lady by the name of Julie Fagan, who uh, chaired the Communities for a Drug-Free Colorado program, who was Governor Romer's uh, executive assistant uh, in, the, in the Colorado experiment, which was very, very successful. Uh, we also are in the process of implementing now the 88 Act, the requirement that we have a clearinghouse, the requirement that we have regional training. Uh, we've also, uh, as a result of the experience uh, of the Secretary requesting information from all 3,300 public housing agencies, about what they're doing about drugs are in the process of compiling a cookbook, if you will, a resource book of all of the best and brightest ideas to address, for the tenants to address, and the public housing authorities to address the drug scourge. Uh, the Secretary is, is very anxious that uh, uh, security be provided first to tenants, that uh, public housing be drug free, that people in public housing have the same rights as people in private housing to be rid of their drug dealing neighbors. And for that reason, he's done two things. First, he has uh, waived the lease and grievance process in a number of states that have due process uh, state court systems for the eviction of uh, tenants who are accused of drug and drug related activities. We're in the process of attempting to do the same thing in section eight or subsidized housing. Uh, throughout the United States, repeatedly, the Secretary has emphasized as one of his six agendas, if not really the top of the list of the six agendas, a, a drug-free environment. And it's very aggressive in working with uh, public housing agencies, in working with tenant groups, in working with the neighborhood leaders, civic leaders, community leaders, uh, in attempting to address this problem. And we anticipate in the very near term we'll have a much larger announcement bringing in the public sector, the private sector, uh, members of Congress, obviously community leaders, to help us address this problem. Well, thank you for your answer, gentlemen. I'm, I'm, I know my time is probably up. I know Mr. Schumer is waiting. Uh, I, I would like to visit with you about the drug, about the free enterprise zone concept, too, at some point when we have time on how that might apply to Omaha. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Schumer? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me apologize to the committee and to the witnesses for being late. I had a longstanding commitment in New York. And my questions will fall into two areas. First, which I'll get to next, is really relates to the issue of dollars. Because I would say to Mr. Hoagland, the one constructive program that puts roofs over people's heads that was proposed here is the voucher program, a program I disagree with, but so be it. Let's have our disagreements. If in the next budget, 
the administration requests the same amount of vouchers as this year, the city of Omaha will get on a pro rata basis about 47. So there'll be 47 households uh, done with. And I guess I would say to my good friend, the undersecretary, and I'd say it to the secretary himself, for a year, or almost a year, we have really welcomed the initiatives, the interest, and the spotlight on housing that the secretary has provided. But the ultimate test for the secretary and for HUD is gonna be, can you get more dollars? Because there's no way, with all the reforms in the world, and they are important, and with all the uh, attention in the world, that we're gonna put roofs over people's heads without some more dollars. And I, for one, just being one member, would say, I am gonna carefully scrutinize the January budget that the president submits. And if we don't have more dollars, it's gonna be very disappointing to the low and moderate income people who need housing. And it, I think, will ma make all of us think twice about how successful this administration is going to be in carrying out all the words uh, that we have heard. I'd now like to get to the area of reform and then I'll come back to the dollars. Again, as the secretary knows, as you know, uh, I think the secretary has been terrific in the area of reform in terms of his outspokenness, in terms of his admitting a problem and trying to deal with it. But I'm a little perplexed right now on a couple of scores. First, we don't have a legislative proposal from the secretary, from HUD. It is optimistic at best and unrealistic at worst to expect the Congress to approve this unless we were to just be a rubber stamp within a month when we're gonna leave here. I mean, I think the chairman has said he will make every effort to try, but it certainly is gonna be extremely difficult to get a package of reforms through that's put down on our desks at October 18th, the earliest, when session is expected to end in November. And uh, that may be no one's fault, but this idea that uh, you know we have to vote on them within two days of the proposed administration, you know, the proposed reforms is unsettling to me, even though I welcome the secretary. And so it leads to my question: of the 44 reforms proposed by HUD's own admission, 17 could be administratively implemented. By the anal our analysis, by the analysis that I have here. Another seven, which you call legislative, could also be there is no statute or nothing in the law that would prevent you from doing these administratively. They include what you call ETH1, -E Ethics 1, the allocation of a housing, housing assistance using a needs-based formula on a competitive process, ETH2, public disclosure of allocation and funding decisions, ETH-5, Sunshine Waiver of Regulations, MR-2, Appointment of HUD Chief Financial Officer and Controller of FHA, yeah. as well as FHA-1, Require Annual Audited Financial Statements for FHA. My analysis, it's pretty clear that you could do those as well as the other 17 administratively, and that would end up being the bulk of your package. Now, admittedly, if Secretary Kemp were to move on, future Secretary could undo them, and it's better to have a statute but instead of just pounding the table and saying Congress has to do these within three weeks or four weeks, why don't you just, just administratively implement them, the 17 that you say could be, these other seven, right now? Mr. Schumer, we are administrating, administratively implementing each and every one of them to the extent that we can. 17 that we've identified, we, will, we are looking at all of the balance of them and if there is any one of the others or all of the others that we can do administratively without legislation, we will do so. Some of them may require regulations and not legislation. However, we do believe uh, that our job is not just to clean up uh, HUD for the time that we're there. In point Understood. of fact, we would not need uh, legislation or administration. I mean, we're going to run this thing right while we're there. I don't uh, doubt but, that. Uh, uh, despite, but uh, we are temporary uh, tenants of these uh, offices at 451 7th Street, and it is important that we leave that institution uh, running right and that it not be subject to abuse in okay. the future. Mr. Undersecretary, I understand that completely, and no one is saying 
that we shouldn't do these statutorily. But if you can do the vast majority of them administratively, then saying that Congress has to do them by November 15th, it's adjournment date, we shouldn't do anything else, doesn't really ring true because you can do them and then we can statutorily adopt them, modify them some, when the new session of Congress, when the next year of Congress convenes. So I guess my question is how many of the 17 have been, the 17 you say, have been administratively put into effect thus far? We are acting as quickly and as immediately as we possibly can. Some of them, uh, I, I, I will supply for the record an exact breakdown uh, on, right. on each of them and the status uh, uh, of each. Let me just point out that in no cases are we proceeding in the old way of doing business. Uh, we're beginning and we're at, the, at the, the threshold of a new fiscal year, so we intend uh, to put sunshine on all of the funds that are appropriated uh, and all of the uh, funding rounds for uh, uh, fiscal year 1990. Uh, and we will uh, implement each and every one of them uh, as quickly as we can. Do you have any time frame as to when any of them will be actually in effect? We are in the process uh, right now, for instance, on the chief financial officer of beginning the efforts to recruit, of creating that position, doing the, the internal uh, job uh, description work. We are about to sign a contract with the National Academy of Public Administration uh, to help us design the structure of that organization. So we're moving out on, on that one. We've begun uh, reform uh, in the area of uh, uh, discretionary and headquarters uh, reserve uh, uh, funds that, uh, that were uh, left over. We have uh, uh, imposed uh, competitive uh, standards on all of the allocation decisions that are, uh, are underway. Uh, we have, uh, in the area of uh, one of the areas of questioning before your arrival, uh, here today was uh, the statutory uh, use in our legislation that would propose uh, uh, the measuring of low-income tax benefits with uh, HUD program benefits. And our housing commissioner, Austin Fitz, has already begun to do that administratively uh, with the funds that are now available. As a matter of fact, she began that effort, I would say, in June, right after the mod rehab, right after we became aware of that double dipping problem. Right. Uh, so we are acting on each and every one of them administratively as we, as we can. Uh, Let me ask you a question. Are there any of the major reforms that you couldn't, I mean, you've, I've given a list here of the seven that I thought that you listed as legislative. Maybe you just prefer to do it legislative, but that you could do administratively. Are there any of the major reforms that you have proposed that you couldn't do without a statute? Uh, uh, maybe Mr. Keating should answer that Keating question. Answer that. <clears throat> Mr. Schumer, I'm afraid I, I can't say every one of them, but I can look, for example, at the ethics package and give you, for example, civil monetary penalties, uh, ethics seven. Uh, the, any, any penalty associated with any of these, for example, all the penalties. That's correct, would require legislation. Right. Uh, a number, as the uh, Undersecretary has indicated, a number, for example, bankruptcy, uh, CDBG, anti-poverty strategy, a number of those program things evaluation. will require program evaluation and amendments under management, rulemaking, uh, rulemaking under FHA. There would okay. be a number, but... A few of them. But you agree that most of them could be done administratively. Do you have any disagreement with the ones I mentioned? Could you allocate housing assistance using a needs-based formula or a competitive process? I would say a significant number of these can be done administratively. And as Mr. Delabobi has indicated, we're really running on a parallel track. We, we would Good. like to permanentize this. So obviously no we're question. here. This is the package that went to OMB last night. So we have a substantial reform bill that we drafted in-house for the purpose of their review. And of right. course, your But we have no action. disagreement that temporarily, while the legislative process awaiting, of course, the submission of them to us, uh, wins its way that a large number of them could be implemented administratively by regulation. We're going to attempt to implement all those that can be administered. And it's a large percentage, would it not you agree to that? Number, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and none of the ones that I've mentioned, at least initially, comes to mind as having any problem doing it administratively. I don't think so, but a number of them you mentioned, I can't say for sure. I would say okay. that the bulk of those that you 
okay. you shared with us. My next area. And, and if I may just sure, comment, please. Mr. Schumer, we would be more comfortable uh, in a week to 10 days after our assistant secretaries have been able to analyze it, each and every one of them. We have asked, I have asked for a report from each, each of them telling me exactly that. If they can do it administratively, uh, if not, why not? If it's a regulation, how quick we can do a regulation. If it's, if it's a law, uh, then we, we know what, what You'll the have to is. do on almost all of them. You will have to publish the regulations and await comment as well, so you can't do them immediately, and, and I that's, understand that. That's part of the But, problem. you know, if we're going to be out of session from Thanksgiving till the end of January, and it takes a month or two for the process to yes, get so going, uh, I don't see it as a major barrier to at least getting most of them in uh, implemented. But we are not able to change regulations when you are not in session, and that's one of the, the reforms that we're proposing, and that will tie us up with the regulatory uh, package because we require a timetable of legislative days, uh, right. and that, that becomes very cumbersome. Okay. Next question does go back to the money issue. You've already indicated some of the things that will be in your uh, new program, your, um, the budget submission. What are the odds that we will see more money in the housing functions in the budget submitted by the President for fiscal year 91 than we saw from fiscal year 90? Well, Mr. Schumer, I'm neither a betting man nor am I the, uh, the director of... Uh, well, you're a very bright man, and uh, I know that for the 20 years we've <laughs> known each other. Well, I'm, I'm bright enough to know that I shouldn't uh, make the budget announcement that is uh, the President's prerogative in February. Uh, but let me let me say this. Well, do we have a good chance of getting more money? The real, I believe we are going to. We have an excellent chance of getting the money we need to get the job done. But let me point well, out. Well, that's the, a relief because I don't question, think you can do that. The question, I don't think anyone, even Jack Kemp, can get that well, uh, done. The question really isn't just one of money. The question is no, it's, the it, benefits that are provided. Uh, how many more families can you provide housing assistance to? Uh, how, what is to me, so disappointing about the money that, that we have authorized and appropriated is that so many poor people see all this money being appropriated and they don't see any improvement in their lives. You see millions of dollars allocated to public housing authorities in Cleveland and here in Washington, D.C., and yet they can't turn a unit around uh, and make it available. Mr. Undersecretary, just at the risk of, I couldn't agree with you more. You need both. But I want at least to say, to state for the record and give you folks notice, and I think there are a lot of my colleagues who agree with this, that if you don't have significantly more money, what you're, you're basically rearranging the deck chairs on the uh, Titanic, that, that we can argue about whether vouchers work or not, we can argue about other things, but I don't think we can argue that for the millions of people who are underhoused, the $9 billion or so of assisted housing in this year's budget isn't enough, isn't even close to enough, and I'd be unrealistic to expect next year you're going to get it up to the 30 or $40 billion you'd need to give each one of them help. My only question is, or my only point is, I think I at least hope to focus the spotlight on, on money as well as the other issues, and I hope that you will be successful. One final question, coinsurance. It seems to me that the coinsurance program is basically unreformable. That because you give such a large incentive up front that the, 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 the profitability of the private coinsurer and the profitability, if you will, or the lack of loss that the government would undertake don't match up. So that, for instance, in the present coinsurance program, if the upfront fee is 5% and the private guy takes 20%, that he, could, he or she could undertake five properties, have four of them fail, or one of them fail, rather, and still make money. Whereas the government, with those same five properties and one failing, would lose its shirt. And it seems to me that the only way to rectify that is to bring the fee down so low or the percentage that is insured privately so high that you won't get any takers. And my question is, how do you overcome that dilemma? We believe that coinsurance can be, can be saved if we institute some very basic and sound 
business practices. Higher minimum capital requirements for the lenders, for instance, higher cash requirements for the developers, improved underwriting standards, basically sharing uh, the risk. Uh, we have a, an internal task force that is working through that problem and about to make specific recommendations uh, to the Secretary. We believe, as the Secretary mentioned earlier this morning, that no coinsurance program uh, will mean no multi-housing program, that coinsurance is providing a role, and that we can save the program. We recognize there are going to be more losses. If we did nothing, if we closed down the program, we would continue to uh, incur losses. substantial sure. losses. Uh, Commissioner Fitz is, is committed to bringing about the kinds of reforms that will enable us to stem the losses and still save the program. And it, it is our analysis, because coinsurance is or, or insurance is so vital to multifamily housing that we need to do everything we possibly can to resolve that dilemma. It's going to be a tough one, but our staff feels <coughs> that it's a challenge we can meet. I would argue to you that the MOD rehab program, for instance, is eminently more savable and reformable than the coinsurance program. Um, and I don't quite understand why the one has been slated for elimination when most of the problems in it were not the structural problems, but rather the political problems that we've all unfortunately seen too much of. Whereas it seems to me the coinsurance program, the problems, while there were the political problems, are basically structural. Well, we, we, in our reform package, the second part of it, which is the prospective look, we'll have a program to meet the needs of mod, moderate rehabilitation. Uh, and uh, we, are, we certainly are, are cognizant of that, uh, of that need. We just do not believe that the existing program uh, is, is, is one So you're not intending saved. to say mod rehab will be replaced by, say, vouchers? Which has well, been a bugaboo. It's been, you know, and I know the secretary and you are looking for new approaches. But we've had a standoff between the administration and Congress. Every time they dismantle a program, they say, well, we'll replace it with vouchers. And vouchers, certainly in my area, where there's a desperate shortage of housing itself, not just a shortage of money that the poor people have, doesn't build housing. So I hope there will be a real program put in place as opposed to simply the fig leaf of saying, oh, we're replacing every program with vouchers. Well, we, we are, uh, you know, the Secretary said, repeatedly. He does not want to be the Secretary of Vouchers. At the same time, we recognize that vouchers provided an increase in assistance to, uh, uh, to families in, in housing assistance. You know, if you look back at the number of families being assisted, and that's what I look at, the benefits. How many families were being assisted uh, in, in 1981, for instance? And it was about 3.1 million families. Today, it's about 4.3 million, largely because of vouchers. So we have 1.2 million more families uh, being housed, receiving housing benefits today due to vouchers. Vouchers do not in themselves produce uh, new units, uh, but they do provide a revenue stream. We believe we can build on that revenue stream uh, to, to uh, provide uh, the supply of housing that's necessary. I would just say to the uh, undersecretary, I don't want to get into a dispute on the Contention, contentious dispute on the facts here, but I would be surprised if there are more than two or three hundred thousand total vouchers outstanding. So well, you can't I, say the 1.2 million, I, I even a majority, was the, vouchers. The, the, it's, it's not just vouchers, it's vouchers, certificates, it's the, it's the whole basket of programs. But the point really is that when everyone talks about cuts in programs, uh, they, they lose sight of the fact that most of the cuts were in a new construction program and that we do have more families benefiting from the federal housing programs, the entire basket of them, vouchers, certificates, 202, whatever it is. And that's a record that we are proud of at HUD, that our employees, many of whom, most of whom are career people who were not involved in, uh, uh, in any uh, uh, illegitimate activities, uh, it's, it's a record that we take pride in, and I think the committee should, too, because more Americans are receiving housing benefits, and we ought to recognize well, that and, and not, uh, not uh, run away from uh, that reality, which is good news. Yeah. I would just say that most of the reason more people are receiving housing was, has been because of the programs passed both under the Nixon and Carter administrations in the 70s, and they're still in there. Uh, the amount that has been added in the 80s has been rather small, and furthermore, the 15-year programs, the Section 8 certificates and the Section 8 stuff, is all going to start expiring. And that will undo the record that was stated before. I just hope 
that you folks will call for renewal of those things, even though they are fairly expensive. Otherwise, we're going to see the actual numbers go down. Well, I don't know whether we will call for complete renewal of the Nixon programs or the Carter programs. No, I'm just talking about the certificates that expire after 15 years. I, they I, started to this fiscal year, and there'll be a lot of them in the next fiscal we year. We are very concerned about expiring certificates, and, and the administration is committed to the renewal of those expiring uh, uh, Thank you. certificates. The Secretary has said that repeatedly. The President stands behind it. And uh, if you could read my lips, that would obviously mean that there is going to have to be an increase uh, in the amount of money uh, that is uh, requested uh, uh, in, the, in the budget. I didn't say it, but uh, you understand that there is no way we can be committed, and we are, uh, to, to that w and, and run away from, from the price tag that, that is going to be required to renew those certificates. And we are committed to renewing, renewing those expiring certificates. We are similarly going to be committed to developing programs that meet the needs in tight markets, markets such as the one in, in, in your district and, and my old neighborhood in Queens. Uh, we recognize that uh, uh, the existing programs do not meet uh, those needs and that something has to be devised. And I might point out that one of the things that we see successful in Mr. Wiley's district is the use of CDBG money in neighborhoods like that. And I certainly have, uh, hope, I am hopeful that in our hometown, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, city officials will make better use of those available funds in neighborhoods like ours. And I've talked to Commissioner Biederman about doing just that. I want to keep this going on forever. I think it is good news that you're going to uh, extend the certificates. I read your lips. And uh, that, too, is good news. Um, remember, CDBG has been cut and cut and cut and is supposed to now cover so many programs that it's awfully hard to say new housing money will come out of them. In New York City, the CDBG money is really go yeah. spent very well and to good purposes. And I wouldn't, I for one, we've been through that, up and down that hill, nine years in a row now, too. Oh, well, we're giving you housing money, take it out of CDBG. That, that's not satisfying. But I, I am pleased with both your comments that the voucher, that the certificates will be renewed, and secondly, that you will look for new programs that deal with uh, housing problems in tight market uh, places. I thank the chairman and yield back my time. Thank you. Mr. Wiley? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm a voucher man myself, uh, Mr. Secretary, but uh, I think the point needs to be made here uh, following uh, Mr. Schumer's uh, statements that uh, we've heard some excellent testimony this morning, and it seems more clear than ever to this member that we do need to move ahead uh, quickly on a legislative package of reform. Uh, the Secretary has said that reform uh, has to be a joint effort with Congress, and although out of the 44 I've uh, looked through here, I think 34 of them probably could be administratively uh, implemented and put into effect right away. Uh, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the Secretary was indicating that uh, even some of those he felt ought to be put in legislative language so that other Secretaries wouldn't have the discretion necessarily to, uh, to mess them up. And if there are good reforms, uh, maybe we ought to statutoryize them. Uh, I think that uh, one other uh, point that I'd like to make is that uh, we, we've learned uh, from GAO reports that the FHA insurance program, which is near and dear to my heart, uh, is still operating with the antiquated data equipment, as they said. And you're quoted as saying, Mr. DeLaBova, that, that uh, uh, the problem is not that FHA has bad systems, but the systems uh, can't talk with each other, and uh, that you need to put some uh, more dollars into the reform of this system. I realize money is tight, but I was thinking, uh, what if we could use some of the savings from the Section 235 refinancing to go back into the FHA fund uh, for additional staff or updating the computer system? Is that uh, within the realm of feasibility? Well, our problem with the systems uh, in integrating the systems is really getting the plan together. We have uh, uh, been fortunate thus far with the Appropriations uh, Committee uh, supporting uh, our effort, at least the beginning effort, to design the, uh, uh, the system. We may have to look at, uh, once we know, have the system designed, there's a tremendous lead time here. And once it's designed, uh, it may be an issue uh, in, in paying for, for the equipment uh, that is necessary. We are at the design stage now, and we have adequate funds to carry out that, uh, that activity. 
These are very complicated systems, though. You don't just go down to the sure. local computer place and pull something off the shelf, and that's the, the difficulty that, uh, that we face. There's long lead time yeah. to get this right. Just throwing out an idea. I know you'll take it into account. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I think we've heard some very excellent testimony very this much morning so. and made a significant contribution. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Wiley, for your tremendous help. I, I did want to sum up by saying that um, uh, Mr. Schumer, I think, referred to the money, and that is uh, the fundamental question. Uh, as an example, in order to fund the additional or the renewal of the uh, certificates, expiring certificates, we estimate that it will require an additional $9 billion so that uh, we do have uh, very serious uh, aspects of just that commitment there uh, with respect to the funding. The um, fact remains, though, when it's all said and done, that in just these uh, months of this year, 1989, this committee has received more cooperation. We've had extremely good communication than all of the eight years of the previous administration. I think the truth is that. And I wanted to express our gratitude for that. I have expressed it to the secretary, but I think today's hearing uh, caps it. Uh, we're now in the month of October, and we've had more interaction, more communication in just these uh, nine months or so than we've had in the past eight years with the prior HUD administration. So we wanted to thank you very much. You've uh, gone above the call of duty. You've been very patient. We're very grateful, but as Mr. Wiley said, this hearing has adduced very valuable information to help us in our legislative uh, endeavors. So thank you very much, sir. Thank you. The committee will stand adjourned until further call of the chair. That concludes this hearing held to review proposed reforms of the Department of Housing and Urban Development. You can see this program again at approximately 2 a.m. Eastern Time. Check for periodic schedule updates for the exact broadcast time. Stay with us now for coverage of a meeting of the Aviation System Capacity Task Force. from the nation's capital. You're watching C-SPAN. We'd like to take a short break to bring you an update.